All right. I haven't done this talk in years and had to rebuild it. And I'm telling you right now, there's folks in this room that can do a much better job than me, much more knowledgeable on this issue. Uh, but it, the Lord just convicted me that we have to start talking about this because in my nation, with the, uh, the new presidential candidate, uh, uh, Mr. Romney, who is Mitt Romney, who is, uh, he's legitimizing the whole religion. And I started traveling and conversations, of course, come up and start turning political. And then I started having pastors and mature gentlemen in the church, elders and deacons in the church, who made a comment to me, just offhand comment, saying, well, who am I to say that Mormons aren't Christian? There's a lack of knowledge, guys, and so um, we need to deal with this, and it just really got put on my heart that we got to deal with it. So remember, you want to get a hold of me? The website is that right there, rforh.com. You can also go to Facebook, type in my name. I'm on there. I try to make myself accessible uh, via Facebook, or you can type in Reasons for Hope, and Reasons for Hope also has a, a Facebook page, and you can get a hold of me like that. Remember, the asterisk always leads to the answer, Jesus, but which Jesus? There's a lot of people that say the name Jesus. And what we have got to get to the point of doing is that, what do you mean by that? Because this is the problem with what we're going to talk about this morning. Same words, completely, totally different meaning. How many times have I been telling you guys, go to the 1828 dictionary, do a word search, know the word that you're using, what does it mean? Go to the word of God. Don't stop there. Go dig with that word. You know what I'm saying? You better do the same thing when it comes to this issue right here because is Mormonism the same as Christianity? And I'll give you the answer right at the very beginning. Not even close. It's not even close. Now, for those of you that are going to sit here and say, well, he's going to be Mormon bashing. Um, no, I'm not. But let me put it to you like this. Is it Christian bashing to state what Christianity teaches? Those Christians, they believe God created in six days. Those Christians, they believe the Bible's the word of God. Is that Christian bashing? No, they're just stating what they believe. I mean, is it Jew bashing to state what Judaism teaches? No. So is it Mormon bashing to state what Mormonism teaches? I'm not going after the individuals because, to be quite frank with you, Mormonism, Mormon, are two totally different things many times. Many, many, many Mormons don't have a clue what Mormonism teaches. Christian, how many of us know what the Bible teaches? You see, many times we're just as guilty because we've got 400,000 churches across the nation of America and we're losing 50 to 88% of our kids. And how many can give an answer for the reason for the hope to lie within them? It's the same issue with the Mormons. Many, many, many Mormons. As a matter of fact, most Mormons that I get in the conversation with don't have a clue what Mormonism teaches. Now, your nation, it's not an issue, right? Hmm. Um, the first missionaries to go overseas, this is the uh, more, uh, LDS website, were sent to Britain in 1837. The oldest active church, Mormon church, is in your country dating back to 1837. Uh, in Preston, dates back to 1837. In your nation, there's 188,029 Mormons. Uh, there are uh, six missions, 332 congregations, two temples, and 116 family history centers. Those are one of the key places where people are kind of brought in because for some reason, we all want to know about our ancestors. Let's go back and study our genealogies, and that's the places that, boy, they're the best. Now, number one, you're not going to outgo a Mormon. They are, for the most part, very good, quote-unquote, people. You know what I'm saying? can be very nice, very sincere, but remember the illustration? How tall am I? Just because you are sincere doesn't mean that you are correct. You can be sincere and sincerely wrong. Very nice, polite. I mean, when I lived in Utah, I lived there for eight and a half years. I'm going to tell you what. Clean, family-oriented. I mean, my neighborhood, we didn't have issues. Their neighborhood watch, everybody was watching out for each other. We had one guy on our street that his job was to know everybody on the street and who had what, in case, not in case, when the earthquake comes, because it's right on a fault line. Salt Lake City is right on a fault line. And there's going to be a major earthquake one of these days, and there's going to be bad things that happen. This guy knew where everybody's gas turnoff was. He knew what equipment they had, axes, 
saws, whatever, so that if something happened, they, man, they were organized. Doesn't mean that they're right. If we're going to understand about Mormonism, we've got to do a little digging, and we've got to look at some of the history. So we're going to do some history, then we'll deal with some of the teachings. But can I start it off by saying this? The story goes that if you want to know what the truth is, you spend time digging in the truth, studying the truth. Bank tellers, you know, you've probably heard the illustration that many times bank, bank tellers were taught how to tell a counterfeit by looking at the counterfeit bill? No, by studying the truth and by handling the truth all day long, handling the truth all day long. Then somebody would come in and try and slip something in there that wasn't true. It just didn't feel right. So I would suggest that you spend 90% of your, no, 95% of your, no, 99% of your time studying the word and knowing what you believe and 1% on this kind of a thing. But we're here, so I throw it out at you. Uh, Joseph Smith is one of the key figures in Mormonism. He's the uh, founder. Uh, interesting story. Like I said, guys, this is so big. You could spend a week studying and not even scratch the surface on this stuff. So just a little history uh, of the church itself. It started in Sharon, Vermont, 1820. Joseph Smith had his first vision, and in that vision... He had God the Father and the Son appear to him and talk with him. Uh, and they, they supposedly, I should say, let me be very clear on that, he supposedly appeared to Joseph Smith, and he made the following statements to Joseph Smith. One of them spake to me, calling me by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved Son, hear him. And I was answered when he asked, what about church? I'm looking, what church should I go to? What church should I join? And he was answered, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and the person that you addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach from doctrines and commandments of men having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Today, many most Mormons, when you get in the conversation, they'll just tell you, oh, we're just a different sect. We're Christian. I mean, look at the title of our, our uh, look at the name of our church. We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're Christian. We're just a different sect. Is Mormonism the same as Christianity? Not from their history, it's not. I mean, from the very beginning. Listen, listen to what, what they taught, what Joseph Smith taught. Uh, they are the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. Now, let's make it simple. If they're the only true church, what does that mean about all the other churches? They're wrong. So is Mormonism Christianity? Not even from their perspective. I mean, in their, in their study, in their book, First Nephi, it says they're saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, and the other is what? That's not the same as Christianity. The church of the devil? If you're not in Mormonism, you are in the church of the devil. This is their teaching. This is a Mormon bashing. This is what they teach. Their books, the Journal of Discourses, the history of all the, 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 the prophets of, uh, of what they received and the teaching that they gave recorded. When the light came to me, I saw that all the so-called Christian world was groveling in darkness. With a, regard, with a regard to true theology, more ignorant people never lived than the present so-called Christian world. What? Are Christians ignorant? Yes, as ignorant of the things of the God as of the brute. All other churches are entirely destitute of all authority from God, and any person who receives baptism of the Lord's Supper from their hands highly offend God, for he looks upon them as the most corrupt of all people. This is their teaching, guys. I guarantee you the vast majority of Mormons don't know it. But it's still their teaching. It's their history. Christians, those poor, miserable priests Brother Brigham was speaking about, Brigham Young, former prophet, leader of the church, some of them are the biggest whoremasters there are on the earth. So, is Mormonism the same as Christianity? From that right, we could stop right there. No, it's not. It's not even close. Because even from their own writing, their own history, we are the church of the devil. But by the way, are the teachings of Mormonism compatible with Christianity? Hmm. Well, in order to understand that, you've got to know what the Book of Mormon teaches. And quite frankly, the Book of Mormon doesn't teach anything in Mormonism. 
None of the unique stuff, at least. What the Book of Mormon teaches is the supposed history of the Jaredites, the Mulekites, the Nephites, the Lamanites, and the Nephites and the Lamanites get in a battle. They lived in America. They have a battle, and they almost kill each other off, but then there's one that's left over, and he saves these bronze plates, and he hides them that has the history of the Lamanites. And, and then years later, Moroni or Nephi, depends on which version you read, appears to Joseph Smith and lead him to these bronze tablets that have the history of Mormonism, the, the Book of Mormon on there. And so he gets them and then he translates them. Joseph Smith translates these bronze plates into the Book of Mormon. Now, before I go any further, what do I mean by he translates? How did he translate these? Now, don't trust me. Don't trust me. Let's go to the three witnesses because this is one of the big things. Boy, you get that Book of Mormon... They have the three witnesses. We saw these things. We handled these things. I mean, these are the three witnesses. David Whitmer, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery. They signed a statement in 1830 saying that an angel had shown them the golden place from which Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon, and they had heard God's voice testifying that the book had been translated by the power of God. That's pretty accurate eyewitness account, right? Hard to refute eyewitness account. There's three of them. They signed the paper. Emma Smith, the wife of Joseph Smith, she was there. She saw the way that they translated. She was one of the ones helping by recording what was being translated, and how did they do it? Well, I'll let her tell you, so I'm not bashing. In writing for your father, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at the table close by him. He's sitting with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. He had a seer stone, which you can go to... Uh, what is it? Um, it's just south, just south of Farmington. Bur Bur um, there's a tiny museum there, just south of where I used to live in Farmington, and you can go actually see the seer stone that he would put in a hat, pull the hat up over his face, and then these characters that were on the bronze tablets would appear, and underneath of it was the English translation. I'll let more of the witnesses tell you. I mean, I, it's not bashing. This is what they taught. I will now give you a description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Joseph would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God and not by any power of man. Another witness to this, uh, he said, by the aid, by aid of the seer stone, sentences would appear and were read by the prophet and written by Martin, and when written, uh, finished, he would say, written. And if correctly written, that sentence would not, or I'm sorry, would disappear, another appear in its place. But if not written correctly, it remained until corrected, so that the translation was just as it was engraven on the plates, precisely in the language then used. Something to consider. If that in fact happened, all right? I don't believe that it happened. And if it did happen, it was demonic. Sitting with your face stuck in a hat, maybe you got lack of oxygen and you started hallucinating. Or demonic. Guys, that, this, this is not of God. But something to consider. If the Book of Mormon was translated like that, the character's there, and it's not going away till you write it down correctly in English, that is the most correct book that was ever written on this planet. I mean, Joseph Smith even said that. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on the earth. Then a simple question. This is basic stuff right here, guys. You can go get a copy, a photocopy, digital copy, of the original Book of Mormon. And if you would like to then compare it with the Book of Mormon that is today, that is being handed out, you're going to see a minimum of 3,000 changes. Minimum. And if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, I couldn't find the act. I believe it's over 4,000 changes today. It's over 4,000. See, I'd heard that, but I couldn't document that. So I know 3,000 for sure, because it was 3,000 some odd. I've got a copy one where they, they go through. And I'm not just talking like little uh, punctuation. I'm talking major stuff. And if that book was translated, not going to disappear until that character is written correct in English. That should not happen. But now let's go back. What about the witnesses? They saw the Book of Mormon. They signed the paper. They saw it. They're eyewitnesses. Really. 
do some more digging because it's kind of interesting what you're going to find. They signed that statement saying that, they had, that the angel had shown them the golden plates from which Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon and that they had heard it. How did they see the plates? Remember, what do you mean by see? Because that's a good question. Let me let one of the witnesses talk to you. This is the guy that saw the plates. I never saw the golden plates, only in a visionary or entranced state. I wrote a great deal of the Book of Mormon myself, as Joseph Smith translated or spelled the words out in English. Sometimes the plates would be on the table in the room in which Smith did the translating covered over with a cloth. I was told by Smith that God would strike him dead if he attempted to look at them, and I believed it. When the time came for the three witnesses to see the plates, Joseph Smith, myself, David Whitmer, and Oliver Cotty went into the woods to pray. When they had engaged in prayer, they failed at the time to see the plates or the angel who should have been on hand to exhibit them. They all believed it was because I was not good enough. Or in other words, not sufficiently sanctified. I withdrew. As soon as I had gone away, the others saw the angel in the plates. In about three days, I went into the woods to pray that I might see the plates. While praying, I passed to an, into a state of entrancement, and in that state, I saw the angel and the plates. He didn't see the plates. He was in a trance. Guys, let your yes be yes, no, no. Anytime there's a play on words, anytime there's a guy that says, well, I didn't really say Bill Clinton, I did not. <laughs> you get into playing on words, you are in Satan's realm. That's why people that play word games with me, I don't have time for it. I don't have time for it. Well, I saw him. Well, I didn't really see him. That's Satan. He's the king of deception. Uh, by the way, these three men, these three men were the only ones who were supposed to have been given that honor of seeing these plates. The Doctrine and Covenants, when you read inside of there, uh, I mean, because of how important they were, they were given this honor. And it said, to none else will I grant this, to receive the same testimony among this generation. These were the three that were going to be given that privilege and honor of seeing those plates. That's it. But wait. There's another eight witnesses. And they got to see the plates. And they got to sign the statement stating that they saw the plates. I mean, uh, you read the, 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 this is all Mormon stuff. I don't use the Christian at attacking stuff. The Book of Mormon plates were ha seen and handled at different times by 11 competent men of independent minds and spotless reputations who published a formal statement of their experience. Well, how did those witnesses see the plate? Did they see it in a trance, or did they see it for real? Mormon leader Stephen Burnett said in 1838 that Martin Harris had told him that the eight witnesses never saw the plates and hesitated to sign that instrument for that reason, but were persuaded to do it. Witnesses of the Book of Mormon who handled the plates and conversed with the angels of God after, were afterwards left to doubt and to disbelieve that they had ever seen an angel. Guys, I want you to just think about this for one second. An angel appears to you. He shows you these plates. This is the truth. Is that going to have an impact on your life? I've never seen God. I've never seen an angel. God's never spoken to me in an audible voice. And I've got to tell you, if an angel appears to me and teaches me something, that is consistent with this book, by the way. Because if he's trying to teach me something new, I'm out of there. <laughs> I'm out of there. If it doesn't line up with this, it's false. That's going to have an impact on my life. How about this spotless character? They had a spotless character. Well, listen to Joseph Smith, what he said about the three witnesses. Well, first, what he said about himself. I have more to boast of than any man ever had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a church together since the days of Adam. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. That's kind of a... I'm sorry, that's kind of an attack on his character. Because ultimately, who does the work, guys? We talk about our ministry. Is it my ministry? It's not my ministry. It's the Holy Spirit that uh, is doing the work and allows us to be involved. I have, I've got nothing to boast about. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a sinner. I'm fallen. I'm fallible. I've done more than Jesus? That's guts, man. 
And what did he say about the three witnesses? Such characters as uh, McClellan, John Whitmer, David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and Martin Harris are too mean to mention, and we had liked to have forgotten them. These are three guys assigned the paper stating that they saw the book of the plates. Some of them translated the Book of Mormon. <laughs> I mean, and, and look at this one. Martin Harris is a firm believer in Shakerism, says his testimony, is greater than it was for the Book of Mormon. Shakerism originated in y'all's country. And he believed in Shakerism more than he believed in Mormonism. By the way, by 1847, not one of those 11 witnesses that signed their name, stating that they saw the plates, that an angel appeared to them, were still in the Mormon church. I want you to think about it. Angel appears to you, shows you the plates. It's going to take an atomic bomb to get me out of there, man, if it's real. These guys were gone. And as I said earlier, does the Book of Mormon even contain the unique teachings of Mormonism? And that's a simple answer as well. No, it doesn't. What do I mean by unique teachings? We're going to talk about that just a little bit. And the second point that I'll bring up to you is who is Jesus? Because that's the question that every one of us has got to answer. You can say Jesus, but who is it? And is it the same Jesus as in the Bible? Is Mormonism the same as Christianity? Depends on the Jesus that you're talking about. So we have to spend some time on that. What are some of the unique teachings that I'm talking about in Mormonism? There's a bunch of them. And like I said, I know there are people in this room right now that can go in depth on a whole lot more. All right. Uh, most of these I'm not going to spend time on, but there's a lot of unique things. Uh, the one that a lot of you have been bringing up to me is the whole baptism for the dead thing. Yes, that's one of the unique teachings. And it is not in, this, in the Book of Mormon. It's just not there. A celestial marriage, three degrees of heaven, a pre-existence of the soul. We're going to deal with that one. But the way that I want to do it, um, Ivan, I got some video clip here. We didn't get an audio level check, so uh, I'm going to show you some video clips. You had something to do with this one, didn't you? This is from this is from uh, a video that probably I saw in 1988, 89. All right, and uh, it helps to illustrate the point. Mormonism teaches that trillions of planets scattered throughout the cosmos are ruled by countless gods who once were human like us. Please notice, Mormonism, because some of the Mormons that you talk to are going to be like, I don't believe that. I've actually had that. Sitting on an airplane, and I'm like, help me understand this. Help me understand this. You've got trillions of planets scattered out there, and you've got all kinds of gods with their own planets. How does that fit within the Book of Mormon? I don't know anything about that. I don't believe that. Then you don't know your own history. Uh, by the way, pre-existence. Did you catch that? What does the Book of Mormon say? Like, uh, uh, or what does Mormonism say about that? Like most Christians, see, we're Christian. We're like you. We just have our own little unique pieces. No, you're not. Like most Christians, Mormons believe in life after death. But members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints also believe in life before birth. This unique doctrine helps them understand who they are and the purpose of this life. So there's the pre-existence that we all had. Before this mortal life, everyone existed as spirit children of God. Mormonism teaches that during this period, which the Latter-day Saints call the first estate, everyone knew and worshipped God the Father. Hmm. Also revealed by the Lord to Joseph Smith is the doctrine of our eternal nature. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. So let's just contrast something here. Judeo-Christian versus Mormon beliefs. Creation. How did God create? Well, God spoke everything into existence from nothing, or a God that took pre-existing matter and arranged it into what we see today. Which one did God do? The top one. What does Mormonism teach? The bottom one, that God took pre-existing matter and arranged it. Uh, by the way, it's a great explanation on why this earth is young. Really, it's only about 6,000 years because the scripture is very clear on that. But the material is really millions of years old. That's why when you radioisotope something, you can get the millions of years because the existing material was taken from all these other places. And it's actually millions of years old, but it was just rearranged into this place about 6,000 years ago. That's what Mormonism teaches. I've had these conversations with them. No. God spoke. There was nothing. There was something. 
That's the God that we serve. That's a different God than somebody who takes and arranges stuff that's already been there for a while. Um, Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. All things, think about this. He created all things. He didn't take existing stuff. He created all things. It's a different God. That are in earth, visible and invisible. Does that cover everything? He created everything. All of that, not taking it and rearranging it, whether they be uh, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. By the way, who's being spoken of there? Michael or Adam was one of these. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Peter, James, and John, Joseph Smith, and many other noble and great ones played a part in the great creative enterprise. So all of these were helping Jesus to do the creation. That's not Judeo-Christian. Um, another vital point, who's God? That's a key point, right? If we're going to say that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we better agree on Jesus and we better believe, agree on God. So who's God? They say that long ago on one of these planets, to an unidentified God and one of his goddess wives, a spirit child named Elohim was conceived. This spirit child was later born to human parents who gave him a physical body. That's the God of Mormonism. That's the God of Mormonism. Judeo-Christian, Mormon beliefs, God the Father. Spirit child of a God and one of his many wives or the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, morally perfect creator of the universe. Which one is the one that we serve? Guys, they're not the same. You can use the same word, but they're not the same. Brigham Young, he said this. He taught that Adam was Michael, the archangel, the ancient of days. In the same message, he also taught that Adam was our father and our God. Brigham Young taught that Adam, Adam was God. Then he came here and brought one of his spirit wives with him. That's a different God. And there's even worse. Our Father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. He finished this message by saying, Now let all who may hear these doctrines pause before they make light of them or treat them with indifference or they will prove their salvation or damnation. Guys, I'm not afraid to take a stand against that one. Adam was not God. God the Father? Judeo-Christian? Biblical Mormonism? Well, one teaches there's only one God. One teaches that there's one of many gods. Which one does Christianity teach? There's only one God. He manifested himself as God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, so, some of the Mormons that I had conversations with, again, Mormons, Mormonism, some of the Mormons would say, well, we're not polytheists, you know, many gods. We are henotheist. We just believe that, you know, the possibility is there. What's that? That's a play on words. I don't like the play on words thing. It's like, come on, get real. If you got God the Father taking one of his spirit wives and having another child who turns into a god, you got many gods. Mormonism, a god, one of the separate gods in the Mormon godhood who are among, uh, who's God the Father, sorry. A god, one of the separate gods in the Mormon godhead who are among many gods in the universe. I have always declared God to be a distinct personage. Jesus Christ, a separate and distinct personage from God the Father. And the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. So you teach polytheism. You teach many gods. You don't play games on the words, all right? So how do we deal with that? Here's another teaching. How many gods there are? I do not know, but there never was a time when there were not gods, plural, plural. Oh, by the way, remember what that, you know what that means, that God has not always been God. There's a unique saying that they say, as God is, oh no, as man is, God once was. As God is, man can become. That's what it teaches. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. As man is, oh, I didn't even know I put it in there. I was just going off memory, sorry. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. That is not Judeo-Christian teaching. 
Here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you. I did not capitalize these Jesus in the original, because you and I know that this is not the God that we're talking about. It's actually a different God, so it should be lowercase, but I kept it in the original writing, just to make sure. The Lord created you and me for the purpose of becoming gods like himself. Are we talking about the same Christianity? Guys, this is totally different. He is the firstborn of the Father by obedience and devotion to the truth. He attained that pinnacle of intelligence which ranked him as a God, as the Lord omnipotent, while yet in his pre-existent state. So the God that we're being compared with is not the God uh, that is being compared with Christianity is not the same. But let's keep going, there's more. Through obedience, to Mormon teaching and death and resurrection, he proved himself worthy and was elevated to Godhood as his father before him. Mormons believe that Elohim is their heavenly father and that he lives with his many goddess wives on a planet near a mysterious star called Korah. Here the god of Mormonism and his wives through endless celestial sex produced billions of spirit children all right, let me get this spider. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Sorry. Very, very vital point. Under the teaching of uh, Mormonism or any other group, we have to be concerned about who do they teach is Jesus. I don't care what group you're looking at. Get rid of Mormonism. Anybody that wants to come and talk to you and teach you anything, you better know who, what Jesus they're talking about. So, Mormonism teaching, who is Jesus? You just heard. He's God, or he's one of many spirit children of God, the Father who through obedience to Mormon teachings achieved Godhood. There's a contrast there. Judeo-Christian belief system, he is God. A spirit child? That's not the God that we serve. How about this one? <laughs> He is God, or there were several holy women that greatly loved Jesus, such as Mary and Martha, her sister, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus greatly loved them. If all the acts were written, we no doubt should learn that those beloved women were his wives. So which Jesus are we talking about here? Are we talking about the one who is God, who came, who died on a cross? Or are we talking about one who uh, was a polygamist? That's what Mormonism teaches. Jesus was a polygamist. It's not the same Jesus. To decide their destiny, the head of the Mormon gods called a great heavenly council meeting. Both of Elohim's eldest sons were there. Lucifer and his brother Jesus. What? <laughs> Mormonism is just another sect of Christianity? What Jesus are we talking about here? Jesus, who is God, or Jesus, who is a spirit brother to Lucifer? I don't know which God you're looking at, man, but they're not close to being the same. A spirit brother to Lucifer? Don't trust me. Let, let me let the writings, because that's a video. Somebody could have just put some stuff in there. Let, let's let them talk then. The appointment of Jesus to be the Savior of the world was contested by one of the other sons of God. He was called Lucifer, son of the morning, hardy, ambitious, and covetous of power and glory. This spirit brother of Jesus desperately tried to become the Savior of mankind. Huh. It's in the writings. That's not just bashing. That's truth. That's what they taught. Long before you were born, a program was developed by your creators. The principal personal, uh, personalities in this great drama were Elohim, perfect in wisdom, judgment in person, and two sons, Lucifer and Jehovah. Is Mormonism the same as Christianity? That's not even close. Think about what, you, what, what, what we just heard there. At some point, Heavenly Father called a council in heaven, which all, these, all of his spirit children attended, and presented a plan of salvation. Oh, remember that. Remember that. Does that sound like something we would talk about? Plan of salvation? Yeah, there's a plan of salvation. 
What's their plan of salvation? Same word, two totally different meanings. There was a limit to man's progression in the pre-mortal world. The goal was to become like Father himself, who is a glorious resurrected being with an incorruptible body of flesh and bone. In order to progress, God's children had to be tested, found worthy, and resurrected. Mortal life would provide each spirit being with a physical body. So, how did we get spirit or human bodies? A plan was presented to build planet Earth where the spirit children would be sent to take on mortal bodies and learn good from evil. Lucifer stood and made his bid for becoming savior of this new world. Wanting the glory for himself, he planned to force everyone to become gods. Opposing the idea, the Mormon Jesus suggested giving man his freedom of choice, as on other planets. The vote that followed approved the proposal of the Mormon Jesus who would become savior of the planet Earth. Is that Judeo-Christian teaching? Oh, by the way, think about this. This is something that hit me when I was watching that. Lucifer came up with this proposal. What did Jesus propose? Something that had already been done. He's not even creative enough to come up with something new. This is what we did on other planets. Why don't, why don't we do it here? Come on. Come up with something unique. Through the physical body, mankind could be tested. The loss of memory of the pre-existence and the separation from God which uh, would force men to live by faith. The plan allows man to gain wisdom through experience, guaranteed by his free agency. The plan of salvation. Here's the plan of salvation. See if it's the same as what we would consider. Was devised by a loving God before the foundation of the world. It is the plan through which he can lead his children to the same exaltation he enjoys. So the plan of salvation is for you to become a God. That's not the plan of salvation that I see in the Bible. Because man is guaranteed his free agency, the Lord presented his, uh, the plan to his children so they could have the choice to participate. Jesus Christ, also known as Jehovah, was the firstborn of God in the Spirit. Through him all the worlds had been created. God and Jehovah knew that men would fall in sin. Therefore they needed a Savior and Redeemer who could make an infinite atonement, satisfy the demands of justice, enable man to return to the presence of God. This is not the same Jesus that we worship. Plan of salvation, child of God versus become a God. Those are two, two totally different ways. There's more. Enraged, Lucifer cunningly convinced one-third of the spirits destined for Earth to fight with him and revolt. Thus, Lucifer became the devil and his followers the demons. Sent to this world, they would forever be denied bodies of flesh and bone. You think that's made up? Let's take a look at the, what they wrote. And the second was angry and kept not his first estate, and, that, and at that day many followed after him. Lucifer declared war on God and Christ. One third of all the spirits sided with Lucifer. A war ensued with Latter-day Saints, which, uh, which Latter-day Saints referred to as the war in heaven. And Lucifer and his followers were cast out of heaven. After being cast out of heaven, Lucifer became the devil. Lucifer and his followers were denied bodies. From this, Latter-day Saints understand that all who have been born and all who will be born choose to follow Heavenly Father's plan because they have been given bodies. But there's more. Those who remain neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. That's the teaching. This is why blacks were unable to hold the priesthood until 1978 because you didn't fight you stood by on the sidelines now Judeo-Christian Mormon one race the human race blacks because they didn't join Jesus and God and the Father in the battle for the pre-existence are those the same those aren't the same not even close and I can read I can read but I won't do it I can read you what they're talking about I, I should read this one a couple of them um, we must not intermarry with a Negro. Why? If I were to marry a Negro woman and have children by her, my children would all be cursed as to the priesthood. If there is one drop of Negro blood in my children, as I have read to you, they receive the curse. Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to this chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, that's how we got black people, the curse of Cain? By the way, study the scripture. No such thing. 
The penalty under the law of God is the death is death on the spot. Cain slew his brother, and the Lord put a mark on him, which is the flat nose and black skin. Guys, that's not in the scripture. It's not in there at all. This is not the same. But there's another group. I see a lot of you here today. Hmm, I got a pretty good group today. The spirits that fought most valiantly against Lucifer would be born into Mormon families on planet Earth. These would be the lighter-skinned people, or white and delightsome, as the Book of Mormon describes them. Ah. So I see a number of the lighter-skinned folks here. Thank you for fighting on the right side. Guys, you've got to be careful. I don't want a Mormon bash. But I want a teaching bash. That's horrible. That's terrible. And then shall they rejoice. This is from the Book of Mormon. For they shall know that it is a blessing unto them from the hand of God, and their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and delightsome people. It used to be taught got the writings on this as well. They would go to the Indians, the blacks, and if they accepted Mormonism, they actually became lighter over time. Their skin lightened up. They became a white and delightsome people. Um, but there's a problem. It didn't work. So guess what? This is one of the 4,000 changes in the Book of Mormon. It's now a pure and delightsome people because it's kind of embarrassing. The black people weren't turning white. Is Mormonism the same as Christianity? That's not even close. I mean, just Jesus. Just take Jesus alone. Spirit brother of Lucifer, spirit born child of God the Father, one of his spirit wives, uh, uh, of his many spirit wives, physical child of God the Father having sex with Mary. Guys, this is another teaching. God the Father came here, took a physical body, had sex with Mary so that Jesus was born. This is a different Jesus. Don't trust me. I'll let, you've got to let him talk to you. How are children begotten? I answer that just as Jesus Christ was begotten by his father, the difference between Jesus Christ and other men is this. Our fathers in the flesh are mortal men who are subject unto death, but the father of Jesus Christ in the flesh is the God of heaven. God came here in a physical body, had sex with Mary, and that's how we got Jesus. These name titles all signify that our Lord is the only Son of the Father in the flesh. Each of the words is to be understood literally. Only means only. Begotten means begotten. A son means son. Christ was begotten by an immortal father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. By the way, more teaching? Is it the same as Judeo-Christian? There's no such thing as original sin. Not in Mormonism. They, the Christian world, have been long taught that Adam and Eve were great transgressors. We, the children of Adam, should rejoice with them that through their fall and the atonement of Jesus Christ, the way of eternal life has been opened up to us. It's a good thing that Adam and Eve fell. That's a great thing, because by that, now we can become gods. Guys, that's different. That's different. Remember, Jesus is a polygamist. I just threw that in there. You think I just ran by it? No, I'll let the writing talk to you for a second. Uh, I discovered that some of the Eastern papers represent me as a great blasphemer because I said in my lecture on marriage at our last conference that Jesus Christ was married at Cana of Galilee, that Mary, Martha, and others were his wives, and that he begat children. This is a different Jesus. This is a different Jesus. How about some other differences? Here's one that should break your heart. Jesus' death on the cross wasn't able to pay for all sins. Jesus paid it some, some to him I owe. But men may commit certain grievous sins according to his light and knowledge that will place him beyond the reach of the atoning blood of Christ. That's not the biblical Jesus. And by the way, Mormonism teaches that you're not supposed to worship Jesus. 
We worship the Father and Him only and no one else. We do not worship the Son and we do not worship the Holy Spirit. We know perfectly well about what the Scriptures say about worshiping Christ and Jehovah, but they are speaking in an entirely different sense. The sense of standing in awe and being reverently grateful to Him who has redeemed us. Worship in the true and saving sense is reserved for God first, the Creator. That's Jesus. Some holier-than-thou students begin to pray directly to Christ because of some special friendship they feel has been developed. In this conception, a current and unwise book which advocates ga gaining a special relationship with Jesus contains this sentence, quote, Because the Savior is our mediator, our prayers go through Christ to the Father, and the Father answers our prayer through His Son. Unquote. This is plain sectarian nonsense. Our prayers are addressed to the Father and to Him only. They do not go through Christ. You have never heard the First Presidency or the Twelve advocate this excessive zeal that calls for gaining a so-called special and personal relationship with Christ. Guys, is Mormonism the same as Christianity? It's not even close. There's a bunch more. Maybe this is enough to just challenge you to think and to dig but I'm going to end with one verse because then Tom's going to show you a video and I think this verse kind of ties it all up for me we need a little humor to lighten it up so I'm going to let Tom do that because this is sad I mean this, this breaks my heart seriously I lived there I had folks come into my house on a regular basis and they're sincere and they were nice and they're going to hell and that should motivate us. That should motivate us if we believe that. that should and that's what I'm going to hit in the next session. That should motivate us to get serious about starting to be able to give an answer because we are getting converted. The church, quote unquote, and I know that we're not truly saved if you get converted into that, but the church is like prime picking for Mormonism. And the reason that we're prime picking is because we don't know why we believe what we say we believe. Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ.